In this video... <laughs> In this video, we are looking at A Good Man is Hard to Find by Flannery O'Connor. Kind of a tongue twister there. <laughs> and we're going to look at why it's one of the greatest short stories in American Southern literature, as well as why her religious background could matter for understanding and interpreting. My son is, it's, it sounds like the grudge is in my house. It's like, dun, 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 upstairs. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome to the Codex Cantina. I am Una. And I am a good man. Mm. So crypto. unlike Crypto, this story was published back in 1953. <laughs> Much older. <laughs> Much older. Uh, and it came out in in the Avon Book of Modern Writing. And I think that's interesting because I've never heard of the Avon Book, but my mom was an Avon lady growing up. Do you remember that? When, oh, yeah. Like the ladies who go to... Do yeah, yeah. So anyways, okay, side story. <laughs> So this title was taken from a blues song written by Eddie Green and recorded in 1927 and popularized by the singer Bessie Smith. In the song, she discovers her lover is cheating on her. All right, so let's talk about Miss Flannery O'Connor. I did some research on her because I had not read her work and didn't know really anything about her. Her and her life is troublesome. Would you agree with that? I she, she yeah yeah good. Let's go with that. Yeah, trouble. <laughs> <laughs> a troublesome soul. I, or maybe a troublemaker, but I like her better for that. Uh, her dad had lupus and died when she was very, very young. And she is eventually diagnosed with lupus. She dies of that very young, like 40 years old, 39, 40 years old. She dies of lupus, which shaped a lot of how she wrote her stories because of her own mortality and that she saw this death of her father very young. So she is from the South. She's from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, and to kind of quote her, I guess, of how you would have to consume her work because it is so gritty. Anything that comes out of the South is going to be called grotesque by a Northern reader. Unless it is grotesque, in which case it is going to be called realistic. I think it says a lot about her that she is writing this for Northerners as a Southerner, and as we know with how impactful we view each other as a society, especially back then, the North and the South was still very much different lives, right? The the industrial mm -hmm. North and the still holding on to the some semblance of the South and the Southern ways and Southern hospitality and the Southern ownership of people still is influential. I would even say a little bit maybe still today. Uh, and as, as a Southerner, you know, I, I kind of grew up with that. She's trying to explain that in a way that someone that didn't grow up with it can understand it. Okay. And as, as your Yankee friend, you can help guide me <laughs> along those paths, right? Sure, sure. But I think it's also worth noting some of her Roman Catholic beliefs, or at least Catholicism beliefs. They come out strongly in this piece, as we alluded to early, which I think can also come from a Southern tradition as well. So let's, uh, let's jump into this. So my thesis for this, Mr. Crypto, is that this story is about being, and there's a lot of different interpretations you can take. Allow me to make my thesis and defend it, and you jump in where, where you feel fit here. Okay. But I think, this, I think this has to deal with salvation. I think this has everything to do with living good and what happens at that moment. And allow me to, to walk through the story as a combination of a plot as well as a breakdown of how I think this story fits my thesis here. Okay. I don't disagree with you, but I think that we should tell the reader really quick up front that there are other ways to view this, obviously. I, th I think there's three. Oh, yeah. There's three. And... Well, minimum. I mean, there's yeah. probably a whole bunch, but... I think the three solid ones. Is mine one of the three solid ones? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be funny if it Woo! wasn't, right? <laughs> and F+. All right. Plus. Uh, so the story starts off with a grandmother wanting to go to Tennessee instead of Florida. And they're in Georgia. Shocking, where the author lives, right? Mm -hmm. So much authors write about what they know. So obviously... Flannery O'Connor is going to write about what she knows. She's going to write about her religion. She's going to write about her life. She's going to write about the violence that she sees in the South. So I'm, I'm going to do a small nitpick here where some people would say she is selfish or a bad person. And I, I, I don't think that you can just throw that out there and it'd be accurate. I think we have to kind of nuance it. 
because I think there's times that maybe she's selfish and I think there's times that she's just being self-interested. And there's a difference between being selfish and self-interested. And why that's important is for a heavy Catholic believer, self-interest is not a sin. Self-interest is allowed and even recognized in the Bible. Selfishness is the problem. Okay, keep going. I'm following. All right, so there's this quote where she says, when they're, when they're talking about going to Florida, she says, I wouldn't take my children in any direction with a criminal like that loose in it. I couldn't answer to my conscience if I did. <laughs> and I think some people would, would say that this is a selfish interest, but she's not looking out. There, there's no malfeasance in this. There's no problem from a societal issue. It's okay to say what you want in this. And the Bible even says, in the pursuit of, of legitimate self-interest in the Philippines section, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interests of others. And that's where self-interest matters because you're not, as long as you take into consideration other people's interests, you're okay. But then this is directly contrasted where you get to some more gray area with the cat because Bailey didn't want that cat to go with them, right? Nope. And she's like, uh, but I don't want him to die. Okay, that's fair. But she also said she didn't want to be alone. And that's when instead of being upfront and honest, you see a little bit more of the double dealings of her at that point. And I think you could make an argument for selfish at that point in time. How did you take that part? I think she's a very complicated character, the grandmother. I think that when it is self-serving, we can see that's very apparent. But when she's being selfish, it's harder to recognize. And I think that it really only comes uh, abundantly clear in the end scene with the misfit. All right, so let's walk through this a little bit. Some of the symbolism in the story, you see her putting on white gloves. She wears the the white violets in her hat, all symbols of kind of purity, cleanliness, and then she judges uh, the the woman's dress, saying that she doesn't look like a lady, right? And there's a little bit of foreshadowing there where people wouldn't recognize her a lady if she were dead in the ditch on the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. Dark, dark, dark. So they're in the South, and then they pass, I think, a black kid on the side of the road. Yep. And she talks about, like, well, he probably doesn't have any pants. Boy, I'd picture, I'd paint a picture of that boy. And I think that's kind of pulling out this, it's a Southern issue. And she's coming on at the tail end, right? But she's still, we're still not at civil, the civil rights movement hasn't happened exactly yet. And you see her kind of dehumanize this boy a little bit. I think you're starting to see a little bit more of that complicated character where you're like, oh, she may not be the best person in the world, right? Oh, yeah. The little boy is definitely a part where you're like, I was kind of just ambivalent about the grandmother, and now she's yeah. maybe not a good person. I don't know. And it's painting this complex picture, which I think is important through the overall theme of the story, is that humans are complicated. Yes, we're not all... People out on fantasy journeys to destroy evil. Life is not that simple. Yeah, it is not black and white. <laughs> no, and, no pun and, intended. And this, is, this, this is my favorite character moment with the grandmother when she starts to talk about Mr. Tea Garden. He was a good man. He invested in Coca-Cola early. He was wealthy. You'd like him. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it, it goes back to that monetary value of ownership of something, giving more... Uh, strength to your family it is okay though it's it's not okay to be greedy it's okay to want to pursue money and wealth as long as you're not harming other people though right Eh, and i think you could harm other people maybe a little bit (laughs) (laughs) but but i think that's one of the clear points where people are like see this is flannery o'connor saying she's a bad person i think i think it's way more complicated that i don't think she's saying she's greedy here i think She is judging people on wealth. She is pursuing money. But is it in self-interest or is it selfish? And I think there's a lot of discussion to be had there, right? There's not enough of the character in this moment to really just flush that out. Yeah, and I think, too, that she's trying to give the Northern reader what they want a little bit here. They, They want to hate this character, right? This is someone you love to hate in the story. So next they kind of go to the tower. And this, for me, if we're going with salvation, we got to talk about The Last Supper. And here's where she's going to have dinner with a bunch of people. They they pass the china berry tree with this monkey out front that, that is like clean at first. Like there's nothing wrong with it. The children are interested. 
But then uh, when they're leaving, do you, remember, do you remember the movie The Shining? Oh, yeah. When Jack Nicholson, oh, Jack yeah. Nicholson oh, sees yeah. that beautiful lady, and then after he kisses her, you know, you see the, the disease coming out from her. After they leave The Last Supper, you see this this monkey starts picking off the, the ticks off of its body. It, it, it becomes more of that symbol of disease, that idea of temptation, if you will. Um, so I thought those were some kind of interesting points for her to put in there. And then now we got to come up to Tombsboro. Hint, tomb in the word Tombsboro. Not a good sign when they yeah. just passed five five to six graves. Did you notice that they passed five to six graves? Uh, I don't think I picked up on that. So I think that's what a big key is for me in kind of understanding, like, no, I really do think she was going for this religious discussion here. Um, I, I got a quote from her where she talks about the myth, misfit, and she says the misfit was a misguided prophet. So people talk about him being the devil, him being evil, and you can go with that interpretation. I'm not saying you need to change it, but I'm going to take that into consideration where I'm thinking she paints this misfit as a complicated character too. I don't think it's as simple as he's good or he always tells the truth, so he's better than the grandma. This is a very gritty story. And when I start to think about this, I think what this moment is, is first of all, when they crash, he comes out in a hearse-like vehicle. He's representing death. This is Judgment Day coming to a allegedly good person, right? And we start to realize that she's complicated. It's not as simple as, are you good, you're going to heaven, or you're bad, you're not going to heaven. First thing they do is they get out and go in the ditch first, right? Like foreshadowing red flags to just be, they're pelting you in the face with them passing Tombsboro, passing these graves, sitting in a ditch. Like <laughs> these are all symbols about what's going to happen. But I think this, this final scene is just so beautiful, the way they talk about uh, what's it mean to be a good person. And the reason why I'm almost, in my mind, my interpretation is a salvation moment is the guy talks about judgment. He says, you know why they call me the misfit? I call myself the misfit, he said, because I can't make what all I've done wrong fit what all I've gone through in punishment. So this is that idea of does the, does the punishment meet the crime or at the same time from like a salvation standpoint, if what you did was that bad, how does that compare with like a salvation moment from a Catholic belief standpoint? Because that's... That's the view that Flannery O'Connor has for her worldview, right? Yeah. I also think there real quick is that the misfit even mentions that he doesn't even know all the crimes that he's done or what he's guilty of. And he says this, I got, I got a quote for you. He yeah. says, I found out the crime don't matter. You can do one thing or you can do another, kill a man or take a tire off his car because sooner or later you're going to forget what it was you done and just be punished for it. Now, is that the most famous quote? No. Oh, damn. I thought that was the one, too. No. That was a good one. But let's take what that says, right? Like, yeah. you can kill a man or you can take a tire off his cart. Both bad. They're both sins. Does that mean they both mean you don't get into heaven? Now, compare that with, I feel like, the way she structured the beginning. Here's all of these things of, yeah. are they really bad? Is she greedy? Is she just self-interested? And I think you get to see this really complicated story of judgment isn't simple when it comes to good, bad, evil, wrong. And I think, to me, just saying she's bad and he's good because he tells the truth is completely missing this, this structure that she set up of showing all these examples of morally and kind of questionable ambiguity of what is good or bad with this narrative of when it comes to dying and salvation, matching up the crime with the punishment and such it's hard to do, right? And I, and I feel like that's what makes this narrative work in the story. And you kind of hear um, another thing. That, so we go back to the five to six graves. And this is the really controversial part where when she looks at him, and she goes, why, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. She reached out and touched him on the shoulder. The misfit sprang back as if a snake had bitten him and shot her three times through the chest. Pow, pow, pow. So this is controversial because now people are like, did she really see the light? Was she, did she reach salvation at this point in time? Because afterwards she was in child's pose, right? Yeah. That's a typical pose that I think a lot of Buddhists were to sit in while, while trying to reach enlightenment. And there's five or six graves and five shots beforehand. Was she saved? And, and they're saying that instead of six people dying, it was really five because she was saved and went off to the eternal life afterwards because the rest of the family was painted pretty rough too. 
right? That the boy kicking the seed and, and the girl, you know, th- this family had a lot of issues and complexity going on that people are arguing, okay, was this really her being saved and she didn't die? Or was she just pretending? Because here's the most famous quote of this piece. She would have been a good woman, the misfit said, if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. And that's the other side of the coin where people are like, no, no, no. She didn't actually reach salvation. She was touching him because she didn't care about her family. She was just trying to save herself. She was being selfish, kind of like maybe some of those earlier points in the piece was. Because he sprang back because he thought he felt a snake, right? So that's kind of the controversial part of this story. And I think that's what's open to interpretation of her perspective is she, you know, she was saved. Oh, you're one of my babies. But that's her thoughts. Then there's the misfit's thoughts where he thinks he sees a snake. So who do you believe? Do you believe her or do you believe the misfit in terms of was she saved or not? I think is a lot of the debate for this piece. My, o- my only other argument for the side that she is not getting salvation, that she is self-serving again here, is that he has on her son's shirt. Mm-hmm. So she's panicking. She's, you know... A little senile, she's gone through this traumatic event, she just heard her whole family get murdered, and now the misfit uh, sitting in front of her is wearing her her son's shirt, and I think that she's trying to convince herself as much as him of their relationship that has been blossomed in this last few minutes, and I think that she's trying to, she's trying to save herself. Well, there's, uh, do you know who Robert McKee is? No. He is a very, very, he's very well known for his writing and writing workshops, but he's got this quote and it's, it's, put this one in your back pocket because this is very useful, (laughs) but you know how those, you know how characters break at the end or when they're put to the test, like, do they turn to the dark or do they turn to the good? Okay. He says, this is a quote from him. He says, true character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. So the idea is at that final moment, that that moment of just right before they're going to die, you see who they really are. Do they turn into a coward? Do they turn into a hero? That's why so many of these movies and writing narratives are structured from a climax standpoint that, you know, particularly like, you know, the fantasy trope, you don't know if the hero is going to make it until that exact moment when either he becomes the hero and brave or or he doesn't, right? And, and I think that's that's the debatable part here is, okay, did she, like you said, was she senile? Was she just trying to save herself? Or like maybe what other people say, she did reach salvation. Why else would there be five or six graves? Why wouldn't there have been six graves? Why wouldn't there have just been six graves earlier if it were, instead of five or six? I think there's a debate for either side. Oh, of course. Yeah, very, very complicated story. And I think that she wrote it in a manner to make us question all of this, to show not only the complexity of the story, but the complexity of us as people and the difference between Northerners and Southerners and that we are all, all sinful, I guess, is maybe how she would see it. Because I think, I think that religious aspect (sighs) comes, comes back really, really heavy here at the end. I love it. I love it. And I want to do more work from her because this is realistic. Like she said, it's some, maybe some people will call it grotesque. I think this is realistic and important because these, this is fiction, right? This is, this is an event meant to pull out probably questions about our own selves of who would we be in these situations? And are we good people leaving up to these moments? Would we be a good person in that moment? Um, I, I think it's an incredible story. So if you didn't know, January, we're looking for the greatest short stories of all time. <laughs> Crypto Here's favorite short story is Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut. So first of all, Mr. Crypto, did this replace Harrison Bergeron as the number one short story in your eyes of all time? I have to say, sadly, no. Okay. Uh, I, I, think, I think that it's going to be difficult to replace just because of the fantasy aspect of the story i like how kooky it is and it's about the you're talking about harrison bergeron now right now yes 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 and for for those that didn't know (laughs) sorry the the story is about our future and 
uh, as a social studies teacher, I'm trying to help mold the future and make better people and better citizens for our country. And I think that that story can encapsulate that better than any other. And I like the little, I, I like the little bit of fantasy that's added in there to it to give it a little bit of spice. And I think this is something to reflect on our past, which is equally as important to do as a history teacher. And I would give it a solid 9.5. Ooh. Uh, All right. Is it, yeah. did it replace signs and symbols as number two or wh- where did it go? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Number two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If of all the stories that I picked, I would have guessed this one had the greatest chance at replacing Harrison Bergeron. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's, it's, it's so beautiful. Yeah. It's such an interesting piece. And I love how she takes the, the gray area of just being like, this is what people really are. And allowing us to enter into that narrative, that that discussion of, is she a good person? How do we judge this person? How do we reflect that upon ourselves? Beautiful story. I'm, I'm a 9.5 as well. Excellent. And I think that this speaks right up to us, right? This is right up our alley where all the religious tones and aspects to the story are very flushed out and create controversy and discussion. And this is something that we love to do here on the channel and we started it because of that, because of what we saw in The Gunslinger, which yes. is kind of the same aspects. And so this is by far an amazing story and something that could be life-changing, I think. This probably came as close to any other story we've had of being like the ideal story we'd like to cover, right? Yes. Impromptu, didn't plan this, but maybe, okay, so for our viewers out there, what stories are like this that have the grit, that have the realism, the complexity, and the religious aspects that, that we need to be thinking about and covering. And please put those in the comments below because we are looking for those stories. So if you have one that's like, oh my God, you guys would love this, please share them in the comments below. Please, please. In the meantime, yes. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you made it all the way to this point in the <laughs> end, uh, this is what we're all about on this channel is discussing these types of things. We think it's important for people to discuss and think and to really break down what does literature mean rather than just reading something and checking it off of saying, hey, I read this. I I think it's really important to say, how does this impact me or help me understand society in general? So with that, guys, please consider subscribing if you enjoy that content. I am Una. Peace out. Peace.